Welcome, everybody, to The Real Story with Adam and Sherry. Uh, we are Adam Pomalian and Sherry Hutchins with Dunham Real Estate Group. We're broker associates, been in the business a combined over 30 years. And we just want to share a little bit of our wisdom and expertise, not only with clients, but potentially fellow agents as well. Today, our topic is short sales, um, which over the last 10 years, we haven't seen much of them since the last recession. Uh, but they're starting to creep up a little bit, and we are lucky that Sherry actually has quite a bit of wealth of experience in helping people that are in this part of the journey. Not always a short sales as the end result, but uh, she's going to share with us uh, our wisdom. So, Sherry, why don't you tell us what a short sale is? Uh, very basically, a short sale is when a homeowner needs to sell their home and their mortgage is bigger and more than the actual value of the home. And how does that happen that somebody like, obviously when they bought the house, they um, paid a price for it and put some down payment. So how is it that they end up owing more than what the house is worth? Yeah, that's a good question. Usually it has to do. Sorry about that. That was my phone. There you Usually go. It has to do with the market fluctuation. Um, the market changes, values go down, homeowner needs to sell and they're kind of stuck. Um, it could be due to an adjustable rate mortgage that resets and goes into a um, mortgage that the homeowner could no longer afford. And at the same time, the market has changed. Again, the house is worth less than, than what they owe on it. So if um, somebody finds themselves owing more than the house is worth, but they don't need to sell and they could still make their mortgage payment, then do they need to sell and make a short oh, sale? Oh, absolutely. They can stay in the house. It doesn't matter at that point. Okay. So it's only if somebody finds themselves in a situation where they have to sell and it's worth more or yeah. worth less than what they owe. Worth so less. What yeah. They yeah. I mean, basically what happened during the turndown was people would lose their jobs and could no longer afford their mortgage. They had no choice but to sell. And if it was short, you know, then it, then they had a problem. The um, so why don't you walk us through the process? Somebody finds that they they need to relocate or they've lost their job and they're going to get ready to sell their house. What what are the next steps they need to do? Yeah, the most important thing to know about a short sale is you've got to have a documentable hardship. You have to prove that you've lost your job or that you've been relocated or that you've had a pay cut. Or maybe you've been involved in a divorce or there's been a death of a spouse or something and you can no longer afford the home. And once that is established, then believe it or not, it's much like applying for a loan. You have to submit your W-2s and your bank statements and your tax returns and um, show where um, that you can't afford the house. And the again, it's much like applying for a mortgage. The lender's got to approve it only they're appro approving to take less money than what you owe them. So that's because not only have you lost money, but the bank is going to lose money. So they have to sign off on losing the money. Yep. They've got to agree to it. They have to agree. to it. All right. And um, so what about preparing the home and marketing it? And does any of that change? Um, obviously, there's some budget around preparing the home that won't be there. But what does actually selling the home look like compared to a regular sale? Um, well, I can't speak to how it would be done nowadays. But during the recession, we did not do anything to prepare the home for sale. Uh, seller often didn't have the money to do anything to the home. And in the recession, we just didn't do painting. We didn't do staging. Um, we didn't even do photography and flyers. We go in and shoot the house with our iPhone because there was no guarantee that the short sale was going to be approved by the bank. Sometimes they came back and said, no, we're not going to approve it. And then the, the house would go to foreclosure. And so it didn't make sense for anybody to invest any money in getting the highest and best price for a house, which is why we work on houses. So I don't know how it will play out in this um, market. There aren't a lot of short sales right now. So who knows? So um, what are the, are there other alternatives to a short sale? So find yourself being upside down with a loan. Um, what are some other options that people might be able to avail themselves of other than a short yeah. sale? 
One of the ways that we can keep people in a house if they want to stay and if they can afford a payment, just not the payment that they've got, is to do a loan modification. And mm -hmm. that is when we go to the bank and say, we've got a hardship here. Um, we want to stay in our house, but we can't afford our mortgage. Can you redo the loan or modify the loan? Um, there's other alternatives. If they don't want to go through the time that it takes to do a short sale, because it used to, sometimes it could be two years to get a short sale approved. Um, and that would be what's called cash for keys. And it's like, hello, lender, I can't afford my house. I don't want to do a short sale. I'm mailing the keys to you. Um, it's all yours. And then the bank would foreclose. Not the best option for anybody. It affects your credit more. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do a foreclosure and the banks don't really want to um, be homeowners because once they have the home in their name, so to speak, then they've got to maintain it. They've got to pay the taxes. They've got to make sure nobody breaks into it and squats, which is what people were doing during the recession. They don't want that. It really makes sense for everybody involved to do a short sale if it can be accomplished. So you just said something a moment ago that a short sale could take up to two years. If you're struggling to make payments, do you do you, typically you continue to make payments during that whole two year process of trying to get a short sale approved? Or do you stop, do the homeowner stop making payments? I mean, that seems like they would be at risk of foreclosure if they stop making payments. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Oftentimes, if people had a documentable hardship, they couldn't afford to make the payments. And by the time I was involved, um, oftentimes they had missed multiple payments. We're not quite at risk of foreclosure at that point. But what happens is when you initiate a short sale is it stops foreclosure action. So yeah, you were telling me something the other day about it. There only being one action allowed that that may be can you tell me more about that? Remind yeah, me. California is a one action state. And that's uh, the, what that means is that the lender can only take one action against a borrower. We're going to refer to them as borrowers instead of homeowners because that's how the lender sees them. So they can approve a short sale or they can approve a foreclosure or they can do a foreclosure, um, but they can't approve a short sale and levy a judgment or force the homeowner borrower to sign a promissory note. That would be two actions. You're only allowed to do one. So what does that mean? Sometimes during the reset, sometime during the recession, there were situations where the lender would come back and say, I've got all your documents. I understand that you have a uh, hardship and I'm going to approve your short sale, but I'm going to force you at closing to sign a promissory note that says, when you get back on your feet, you're going to re repay me the $50,000 that I am short on this. And what happened then was the seller borrower would say, I'm not signing a promissory note. Um, I'm not going to commit to give you money in the future because I don't know that I can actually repay it. And they would cancel the short sale and it would go to foreclosure. Yeah. So. And I think that there was, once that went in a place where that was being forgiven, the, the difference was being forgiven, weren't um, companies sometimes issuing W-2s as that was the income? They declared that as income to you and they had to declare that to the IRS? Yeah, they were actually 1099s. Oh, 1099, yeah, yeah. W-2, I think, is for a job, right? For yeah, yeah. So I'm not a tax expert. I don't play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me either, so... There were two ways that a homeowner could get in trouble doing a short sale. One was, as I said before, having the lender force them to do a pro ask them to do a promissory note or levying a uh, judgment against them. And then you have the IRS step in and say, hey, somebody just forgave you $50,000. I'm going to give you a 1099 and you have to pay taxes on it. So here we've got someone who's got a hardship and they've got all these um, government entities coming after him and saying, oh, I want some of your money. I know you don't have it right now, but I want some anyway. So California did the one action law and the Congress passed a um, tax forgiveness law that was in effect for quite a while. It was extended a couple times. And I believe it might be in effect now until the end of 2025. 
although I would suggest that people check with a tax person or an attorney to make sure that what I think I read is actually the case. All right. So. Well, that brings me to my last question. Um, some of the things you just said, um, obviously, you and I are not tax professionals or lawyers. Who else should somebody who is struggling uh, to make mortgage payments bring on to their team of advisors besides a realtor? And at what point should they invite those other people into the conversation? As soon as possible. So they understand the ramifications of doing a short sale. They need to call their tax person and find out if they're going to be liable for any tax. They need to call their attorney and discuss what might happen if they do a short sale and really understand the big picture. We can help with selling the house and just as important, negotiating with the bank. We're usually the ones who negotiate with the bank on behalf of the homeowner, but we cannot answer questions about taxes and legal issues. So um, I, I did exactly one short sale. Um, they were starting to go away when I got my license um, in 2010. And uh, it was I learned a whole bunch about it. And the company I was working with, they said, we don't want rookies working with short sales. And they had somebody that you were required to use to help do all the negotiation. Um, but uh, you had a, quite a bit. You were that expert, um, and I know that you and Terry Lynn d uh, did a bunch of things together. So if you count all the people that you helped, not just the short sales, the loan modifications and other things, how many of these transactions do you think that you helped with uh, in the last turn, turn, turn down? Yep. Not only were, were Terry Lynn and I doing them for our clients, we were doing for other agents who didn't want to do their own short sales, and we probably did over 100 of them. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Those people. I have stories. You would not believe the stories that came out of that. Yeah. If, um, well, thank you for educating all of us, educating me too. I know um, we've talked about this um, over the past and hopefully it doesn't become a big part of our market story. Um, but no, if you want to, yeah. I mean, we're seeing them every, sorry to interrupt you. I, um, I see them every so often on the MLS very rarely there was a time when almost everything that was on the MLS was a short sale or an REO, which is a foreclosure being resold by a bank. So thank goodness. I don't think those days are going to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not immediately. So, I mean, even though the, the value of homes has been a little stagnant over the last 18 months and some places have softened, it's only been by a few percentage points. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so there's few people that have gotten themselves upside down because mm -hmm. home values have gone down, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that there can't be some uh, significant event that happens that changes things. That's always possible, you know, war, something like that. Um, well, and also, if I can interject here, of course. it's not just that home values went down. It was that there were a lot of interesting quote unquote, interesting loans out there that allowed people to become at risk for a short sale or a foreclosure. And thanks to the Myers-Briggs Act that was put into place at the end Myers -Briggs, of Myers-Briggs, the... not Myers-Briggs. That's the personality test. Myers-Briggs. What was it? Um. Oh yeah, not Myers-Briggs. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> uh, fine goal, no. Uh... Uh, something, something act. Yep. Okay, senior moment um, in the middle of a podcast. But anyway, there was something put into um, place by Congress that said that these risky loans could not be done um, because consumers had no idea that they were signing up for risky loans. So that is a current protect protection that is still in place. Myers-Briggs, what was it? Yeah, what was Myers-Briggs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, boy, that was like everything on the tip of our tongue for 10 years. It, so, so glad you caught that because otherwise people would be going, what is she talking about? She's no real estate expert. Exactly. Um, well, so it was those loan products. So most, most people currently are in a fixed um, mortgage and that's because interest rates were so low that people, as they got into them over the last four or five years, wanted to lock in that low price in a in a market where interest rates are, are potentially going down, uh, or if they're higher, people will look for a, um, adjustable rate mortgages with the hope that the interest rates will go down in the future months and years, and that their mortgage will be more affordable. 
Mm -hmm. And for a while, lenders were using a product that had a component to it where there was a teaser rate or a low start rate that lasted for a short period of time, maybe three months or a year. And then after that time, their interest went up to a full index rate, but they were making a smaller payment. And so they ended up having what was called negative amortization, where they were owing more than they were um, than they did when they began. Um, but those those products have largely been restricted by um, the government for very good reasons. Though we every once in a while we hear them uh, hear things about that. And the other thing that got people in trouble was that they were being approved for loans that they had no business um, uh, being qualified for. They were they were no doc loans. Um, some some people were nicknaming them liar loans, where somebody said I. Um, am a underwater basket weaver and I make $250,000 a year. Uh, oh, no, I'm, I don't have to show you my my tax documents to prove that. Oh, okay, good. I actually make 300000 because I do underwater basket weaving with my left hand. And exactly. my bank goes, oh, great, here's some money. Well, it turns out that you don't make that kind of money and you have a loan that you can't really afford. So Yeah, we, uh, I hate to denigrate our wonderful lenders that we work with by saying liar loans, but that was what they were called. They were supposed to be called a no-doc loan, as you said, but I used to joke that somebody would go in to meet with their lender and the lender would take out a stethoscope, easy for me to say, and say, let's see, you've got a heartbeat, I'm going to give you a loan. How about half a million? You want a half a million? We'll give you half a million. No problem. And then they'd go out and buy a house that they couldn't afford. Yeah. And then they that that was all pre the downturn in 2008. We haven't seen those loans for a while. Yeah, that was abuse of lending, in my opinion. No, so. uh, and I think that, yeah, there's that'll be a whole nother podcast. And uh, that has gone away. There yeah. are all kinds of protections in place for borrowers, so that doesn't happen. Yeah. One of the things that you and I do, which is really important, is we make sure our clients understand um, exactly what they're doing when they buy a house. We don't go so far as to intimately discuss the details of a loan. We send them to a reputable lender who actually sits down and talks to them about that. But we don't want anybody being taken advantage of and getting into a situation where they are buying their dream home that they can't actually hold on to because they've got a bad loan. Yep. Yep. Just because a lender will loan you money doesn't mean you should borrow it. You got to evaluate your own family budget and make sure you understand what that monthly payment looks like and yeah. and long-term investing yeah absolutely Live all right i think that that um is a pretty good um, overview of short sales if okay. for some reason if you're watching this and you think that you might be in this category you want to just learn more about it give sherry a call obviously i mean sherry um because <laughs> she's the one who's got all the details on it uh we um uh, we'd love to help you, A, if you actually do have a problem, figure out a way to stay in your home, and if not, find out the best way for you to navigate that process. Yeah, well, that being said, thanks for tuning in to The Real Story with Adam and Sherry, and we will check you out next time. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye.